السلام عليكم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلاة والسلام على رسول الله المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه المعين تصاق الله خير شيخ سامة the beautiful talk I was hoping that Imam Zayb would be here so we could just cut out the middle man but uh, as the Shaykh Osama said Sidi Asif is very persistent so I couldn't weasel my way out of tonight um, just a few reflections regarding Laylatul Qadr there's so many of my teachers here as well Ustad Abdullah Ali is here he should really be speaking as well um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. Verily, we have uh, sent it down on the night of power. Now, the ulama, and this comes really from uh, Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Mufassir al Quran. He says there's three uh, levels of meaning of, of qadr. When we say laylatul qadr, the night of power, this is the construct phrase. He says one of the meanings is that this is the night of power. Uh, the night of majesty, a night of honor. And interestingly, this is the night when the Ruh, uh, Jibril alayhi salam, descended and came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jabal al-Nur in Ghar al-Hira. And inter interestingly, the name Jibril obviously is not an Arabic name in its origin. It's a Hebrew name, Gavriel, which literally means the power of God, or the majesty of God, or the honor of God. And of course, the Prophet وسلم, although he is a student of Jibril alayhi salam, is better than Jibril alayhi salam because the Prophet وسلم, is khayr al khalqillah, that when he went beyond Sidratul Muntaha, and Jibril alayhi salam could not pass because he said, I will combust into flames. But the Prophet, وسلم, he did pass. And the ulama say that he kept his sandals on. Right? Why, didn't his, why didn't his sandals combust into flames? The ulama say it's because they were attached to the foot, the blessed foot of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam. Anything attached to the Prophet does not touch fire. You have to have strong attachment, a strong ittisal to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said in a hadith, "Fatima tu bid'atu minni, wa man aghdabaha fakat aghdabani, wa man aghdabani fakat aghdab Allah." Fatima is a piece of my flesh. Whoever makes her angry has angered me. Whoever angers me angers Allah subhanahu wa taala. In another riwayah. And on that day, the day of judgment, all relations are cut off except for my progeny and those who are joined to me, those who are connected, have a strong ittisal, have a strong connection with me. So this is one of the meanings, the night of power. Ibn Abbas, he also mentions that one of the meanings is the night of the decree, the night of Qadr, meaning decree, that all of the affairs of the year are decreed on Laylatul Qadr. Although we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed everything before He created the universe, pre eternally. Irada is a pre eternal attribute. Or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decreed this night in previous dispensations and revelations. And indeed, we read in the previous revelations. For example, in the Old Testament, that the book is given to one who is an ummi. One of the meanings of Nabi al-Ummi, in addition to being unlettered, is a Gentile prophet. The Yahud Bani Israel in Medina, they would refer to the Arabs as ummiyun. Laysa alayna fil ummiyin sabil. Right? Ummiyun. Nabi al-Ummi could mean Gentile prophet. The book is given to a Gentile prophet. And it shall be said to him in the Hebrew, it says, Qira which is the exact same cognate word as the Arabic Iqra. This is in the Bible, Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 29, verse 12. And he shall answer, Lo yada'ati sayfar in Hebrew, which literally means, I don't know letters. This is his response. Ma'ani biqari. Right? So this night was decreed in the previous dispensations. And they know him like they know one of their own sons. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya'rifuna hukama, ya'rifuna abnahum. We, we read in Syria literature, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, they say that the Bani Israel in Medina, they used to give good news Bushra to the Arabs of Yathrib, uh, the Aus and the Khazraj, that a prophet is coming here is going to punish you for your idolatry. Right? And this is the Prophet wasallam. One of the other meanings uh, is um, the night of constriction, constriction or restriction. 
So the ulama explain the meaning here, and they say that, as Abu Huraira said, there's so many angels on the earth, on Laylatul Qadr, that the earth seems to be constricted. The earth is literally constricted with malaika. In the hadith of the Prophet, he said, Adadu al malaikati fil ard ka'adadi nujum as sama. That the number of angels on the earth is like the, angel, is like the number of stars in the heavens. It's a night of constriction. That's why the ulama say, based on hadith literature, that uh, you, you know you've witnessed Laylatul Qadr if at Fajr time the sun rays are faded because of the res residual light of the angels, the malaika that were on the earth, faded out the sun rays, right? the night of constriction. It's also a night in which he was constricted, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. That Jibreel alayhi salam, according to the sound hadith, embraced the Prophet and he felt the constriction. And according to Catholic doctrine, this is a sign that this is true prophecy. This is called the law of discernment of spirits. That when a true prophet receives true revelation from an angel from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ultimately from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, immediately he feels a constriction because it's a weighty issue. It's thaqil. Like Musa alayhi salam, according to the Torah and other prophets in the Torah, they try to get out of the mission. Pick someone else, I'm not eloquent, I can't do this. They feel a constriction. This is a sign that it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is according to Catholic doctrine, law of discernment of spirits. Whereas you see false prophets, when shayateen come to them, or awliya, Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jinali, Jilani, rahimahullah ta'ala, it's related that he was walking down the roadway, a great wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and suddenly he saw this vision and this this light and he felt this warmth and this voice came to him Ya Shaykh al-Islam you've transcended the prayer you don't have to pray anymore you're above the prayer you've transcended the prayer and he said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he had to pray six times a day wajib salat al tahajjud and you're telling me I've transcended the prayer anta mal'oon you are rejected you are accursed and shaitan trying to play with him but he felt this expansion immediately all this great fuzzy feeling right but that's not how it comes to the prophets, the true prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the meanings of, of Laylatul Qadr according to the hadith, according to uh, the ulama. Now we're coming to the end, as Ustad Osama had said, Shaykh Osama, may Allah preserve him. We're coming to the end of the month and we have a lot of intentions to make during this time. Obviously this is a time of character reformation. But it's really important that we get into a mode of studying sacred sciences. Study sacred sciences. I mean, just the other day, a brother from another community said, you know, alhamdulillah, I fasted most of the days of Ramadan. So why were you traveling? He said, no, I had to study for a test one day, so I decided not to fast. And so you have to do kafara. What's that? Well, you have to expiate. What, what does that mean? Is, isn't it optional? I mean, this is this very basic People don't know basic fiqh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to study very basic fiqh. Even the fuqaha, very, very high levels. The greatest of fuqaha. They go back six months, every six months, every year, and they begin reading from the very beginning. Aqsamul miyah, the types of water. How to make istinja, how to make wudu, how to make ghusl. They review these things. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to get in, in some sort of study circle and learn these things. And not just depend on our uncles. Right? There's a madhab of the uncle. My uncle says this, therefore it's the gospel truth, so to speak. This is Sahih Kakajan or Sahih... How do, you, how do you say uncle in Urdu? I, I forget. Chacha. Chacha. Right? <laughs> or Amujan, something like that. Everyone has a weird uncle, they say, right? And if you don't have one, then you're the weird uncle. <laughs> <laughs> right? But we need to actually sit with ulama. It's very important. This is how we transform the internal. This is how we achieve... Qurb with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Hamad al-Ghazali mentions, sit with the ulama and take from their prescriptions. And this will bring you near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this will endear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to your heart, just watching ulama, not necessarily even understanding them. I, I attended a dars one time when I first went overseas, an Arabic dars, I didn't understand any Arabic during that time. And I sat and the teacher was expounding on a sacred text and I didn't understand. I got up and left and one of the other students said, no, just sit down and watch him. Just watch what he does. Watch how he speaks, watch how he sits, watch how he points, watch how he smiles. 
And wallahi, I learned more from that not understanding anything. I didn't understand anything as to what he said. But I learned more from that dars than many, many other durus that I have taken. Just by watching the ulama. The Prophet sallallahu is related to hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, That he walked by two uh, gatherings in his masjid. Faqala, kilahuma al khair. Both of them are good. Wa ahaduhuma afdalu min sahibihi. But one of them is better than the other. Amma haulai, fayadruna allaha wa yarrabuna ilayhi. As for one of them, they're making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah wills, He'll grant them what they're asking for. If not, He, he won't give them what they're asking for. As for the other one, As for the other group, they're learning fiqh. And in this context, fiqh doesn't mean jurisprudential things, although that's part of it. We've mentioned this many times. Fiqh here means the essence of the religion. The essence of the religion. They say, the ulama say, like the essence, what is the essence of a rose is the smell. Can you imagine a rose without a smell? You're missing the essence of the rose. The essence. They're learning religion at a deep level. The hadith says, when Allah wishes good for someone, you faqihu fi deen. He gives him fiqh in the deen. In this sense, you can be a faqih, not necessarily in the jurisprudential aspect. Right? But in the sense that you have a deep understanding of the religion. There's no order in the Quran to memorize the Quran, but there is a command to have tadabbur of the Quran. Quran. And this isn't a, there's taqsis, there's no specification here. Ya ayyuhalladina amru. This is for everyone to have a deep tadabbur of the Quran. Obviously, we have to memorize the Quran, and there's great in that. Don't get me wrong, obviously. But we should understand what we're reciting. Have tadabbur. Tadabbur means to penetrate something and to find the end of it. Penetrate the meanings of the Quran. So he said, one group is learning fiqh or ilma, or you alimun al jahila, and they're and they're teaching the ignorant. For whom afdal? They are better. They are the better group. Now that doesn't mean that okay, I'm not going to do any du'a. A du'a mukhul ibadah. This is another hadith that supplication is the essence of worship. We talked about essence. Supplication is the essence of worship. We be, need to be supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people go weeks and weeks without raising their hands. They just do their prayer like a robot. They're thinking about other things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from that. And they don't even remember the last time they actually spoke with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the heart. They just recite the Quran like a parrot. It doesn't go past the throat. They don't understand what they're saying. Even if they do understand what they're saying. It's just motion. It's just adat. It's just habitual custom. Raise your hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves when his servants call upon him in no anthropomorphic way. So then he said, but he said, for whom afdal? They're better. The ones who are learning sacred knowledge, the essence of religion. And teaching the ignorant. For whom afdal? Wa innama bu'ithu mu'allima. I was only sent as a teacher. Thumma jalasa fihim. And then he sat amongst them. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So when we gain sacred knowledge, we should also gain adab. Right? The word adib in Arabic means an, an erudite person, uh, an intelligent person. Because intelligence goes hand in hand with adab, with comportment, having good character, right? That's why someone who has a lot of knowledge and is not someone who has good character, we have to question who are his teachers or what kind of attitude does this person have? That's, an, that's a sign that this person has an ego. An ego, of course, is a Greek word that means I, right? I, like Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, he said the only one who has the right, the haq, to truly say I is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he's a non-contingent being. He's the only real. He's the only one that can say, innani ana Allah. The only one who can say that. And it's interesting that it's, there's a duplication in this verse when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to Musa alayhi salam. Ana, ana. He says it twice. And this is found in the Torah also. Ihyay ashar ihyay. I am who I am. Ana, innani ana Allah. Inni ana Allah rabbul alameen. Right? Like a shaitan was asked, shaitan was commanded, make sajda to Adam, ana khayrum minhu, me, ananiya, egoism. Right? This type of thing. 
So we need to work on our adab, our adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when something goes wrong in our life, we don't breach adab. We don't have su'al adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's going to be tribulations. Allah promises us in the Quran with, with tawkid in the grammar that truly we're going, you're going to have tribulation in your life. Loss of wealth and loss of lives and, and the, the toil of your struggles and these types of things are going to happen. We need to increase in adab. And adab with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Have adab with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's a story of uh, Imam Malik ibn Anas. We told this story last night in a different masjid. Where he was in the masjid. And of course, Imam Malik is a mujtahid, mutlaq. The school of jurisprudence is based on his uh, codification or student's codification of sacred law. One of the greatest scholars of Islamic history. He was in the masjid and... The Abbasid Caliph was there, Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, also known as al-Mansur. And some of these Khalifas, after, obviously after the Khulafa al-Rashidin, sometimes there's, a, there's an ego issue. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from our egos. We all have this problem. They have the problem as well. Al-Mansur was the man who imprisoned Abu Hanifa. He came to Abu Hanifa and he said, I want you to be the Qadi al Quda, the Chief Justice. Abu Hanifa said, no, I'm not the right man for this. And he said, Kadibta, you've lied. Then Abu Hanifa was very clever, very high acumen. He said, if I'm a liar, then why do you want me to be the judge anyway? <laughs> so Al-Mansur didn't like this comment. So he imprisoned him. And some say he died in prison. He was an old man, 68, 69, 70 years old at the time. Anhu. Anyway, so Al-Mansur is in the masjid. And he's having a discussion with Imam Malik. And Imam Malik did not like to argue. His students said that jidal bain al-awam is haram for Muslim laity to sit around and argue about Ashari Maturidi and Salafi and, and Shia and Sunni, this type of thing. He said, this is haram. This is his, the opinion of his students. Jidal bain al-awam. And then he said, jidal bain al-ulama because they have adab and sometimes it's necessary. Even that's makru if you're an alim. Right? So Al-Mansur begins raising his voice. Right? He's probably losing the discussion or something. He's becoming impatient. He raises his voice. And Imam Malik was very, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he's very soft-spoken. He said that I never slept one night without seeing the Prophet ﷺ in my dream. Every night he saw the Prophet ﷺ. And according to the mutawatir hadith, man ra'ani fil manami faqad ra'ani. Whoever has seen me in a dream has, has truly seen me. Ra'al haq in another hadith. Has seen the truth, has seen reality. He saw the Prophet ﷺ in every night of sleep. He used to, when he taught the muwatta in the masjid, he used to say, Qala sahibu al qabr. And he used to point to the Prophet I, uh, the, the occupant of this grave said, this is his proximity to the Prophet As far as spatially, in physicality, but also uh, a relational nearness to him wasallam. So Al-Mansur is raising his voice. And then suddenly Imam Malik says, lower your voice. He's very stern with him, right? Oh, this is the caliph. Lower your voice. How dare you? Right? So then he explains it to him. He said, haven't you heard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَغُضُّونَ أَسْوَاتُكُمْ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ إِمْتَحَنَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ Haven't you heard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, those who lower their, their, their voice in the presence of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For those are the ones whom Allah has tested their hearts with taqwa. They have, they have forgiveness with their Lord and a great reward. Right? We're in the presence of the Messenger of Allah. This was his point to Al-Mansur. We have to have adab with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who's hayyun tariyun fi qabrihi. Who's alive in his grave. This is our aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So then Al-Mansur said, when we make dua, should we face the Kaaba or the Prophet ﷺ? You can read this in as Shifa, Kitabu Shifa, Qadi Iyad, radiAllahu Anhu. Which who should we face? And he said, radiAllahu Anhu, why would you turn your face away from the Prophet ﷺ? He is your Shafir. In other words, do you think Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is in the Kaaba? Astaghfirullah. There's nowhere with Allah. Children ask the question all the time. This is, a, this is a question of a child. Where is God? There's no answer to the question because the question is faulty in and of itself. Aina, uh, a, a 
interrogative particle that denotes space or place or location. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala transcends space and place and location and time and direction. He transcends all of these things. It's like asking, where does the one who resides not reside? Does it make any sense? Or to give another example, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلِ الْأَعْلَى This is just an example. And with Allah is a high similitude. It's like asking, where do the fish fly? Can you answer this question? Where do the fish fly? Say, no, I can't answer it. Oh, you can't answer it. You don't know. There's no answer. The very question is faulty. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala transcends these things. لَيْسَ كِمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ There's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَهْمَ تَسَوَّرْتَ بِبَابِكَ فَاللَّهُ لَا يُشْبِهُ ذَلِكَ Whatever you can possibly think of, Allah is not like that. الْعَجَزُ عَنْ إِدْرَاكِ إِدْرَاكُ وَالْبَعْسُ عَنْ ذَاتِهِ كُفْرٌ وَالْإِشْرَاكُ Whatever uh, you can... Uh, your inability to conceive of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your conception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever has ba'as, whoever talks about the that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the essence of God is committed kufr and shirk. And this is shirk, this is a saying of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So the Kaaba is a created entity. It's not literally the house of God, not in the literal sense. Bil idafa meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala owns everything. And this is a house dedicated to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But children ask this, I ask this question. I remember when I was seven or eight years old, I asked my mother, she said, I said, what is this? She said, this is the house of God. And I literally thought that God is inside the Kaaba. This is a question for children. This is what children ask. Right? So he said, this is created. The Prophet ﷺ is created. But which one is better? Who's better? Khayr al-Khalqillah. The Prophet ﷺ is better. He is your Shafi'ah. So face him. And supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of respect for the Prophet. ﷺ. This was his answer. The Prophet ﷺ is Sayyidu Waladi Adam. Some people say, don't call him Sayyid. Some of the khutaba they get on the minbar and they don't even send blessings of peace upon the Prophet. They say, Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. Astaghfirullah. They call him like he's, like he's their cousin or something. Who, who's Muhammad? Your cousin? Who works over here at the. At the gas station? Who are you talking about? Muhammad said this, Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Abdullah said this. Who are you talking about? You're talking about Rasulullah, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks to the Prophet, he doesn't use his first name. Never says, Ya Muhammad in the Quran. Never says, Ya Ahmad. Ya ayyuhal nabiyyu. Ya ayyuhal rasul. Ya ayyuhal muddathir. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the first person with a title. But you're on the minbar saying this and that. And they say, don't call him Sayyid. Some of the khutaba I've heard. They say, this is bid'ah. You call him Sayyid. Right? Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, who's Imam of Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah. He's a teacher of An um, Malik ibn Anas and Nu'man ibn Thabit. Ja'far al-Sadiq, great, great, great grandson of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Yaseen could mean, Ya Sayyid. Wallahu alam. This is his opinion. Wallahu alam. Huruf al muqata'at No one knows the meaning. But this was his opinion. Possibly, maybe. Allahu alam. Ya is a vocative particle. Sayyid, Ya Seen, O Master. Inna ka la min al Quran al-Hakim. Inna ka. Right? Ka, ka fu al-khitab. Second person, masculine and singular. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking directly to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is part of his evidence. Anna Sayyidu Waladi Adam is hadith. I am the master, the Sayyid of the children of Adam. We should use a title. We don't want to breach adab with the Prophet. If we breach adab with the Prophet, then we breach adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how it is. This is how it is. There are people who mock Sunnah. They mock Muslims who mock Sunnah. Muslims who mock the turban. I've heard these things coming from people standing on minbars. People making fun of turbans and beards and things like that. These are, these are sunnah. These are, these are uh, transmorphic, transtemporal sunnah of the Prophet It's very dangerous to do that. So, I'm just trying to kill some time here. <laughs> I don't see him coming. Believe me, if I saw him coming, I would sit down. So, Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. So we need to increase our knowledge and our love of the Prophet 
and defend him sallallahu alaihi wasallam defend him you know there's i mentioned this also somewhere last night i don't remember where it was there's 13 european nations in the western world that have laws that are anti holocaust laws that if you question the holocaust they will put you in prison right free countries freedom of speech right but if you question the holocaust they'll put you in prison you'll go to prison which is very interesting right there was a man named david irving from oxford who was is an academic he showed up in in austria to give a speech on the holocaust and we don't deny the holocaust it's established through tawatur this is an issue that is is just pure idiocy for muslims to get into it's established through tawatur and if we question that then our our way of looking at history is compromised that's the bottom line and this whole thing about this kind of anti-jewish sentiment i'm i don't get down with that at all unfortunately some of this has permeated into muslim cultures around the world this is completely haram to have this opinion about human beings okay so i don't i don't agree with david irving whatsoever this is just an example and i'll show you the point of this in, in a minute inshallah ta'ala so he stands up at the podium gives an academic speech about the holocaust and immediately he's taken to prison immediately for one year he's taken to prison right yet if you go to a bookstore here barnes and noble or i guess there's no more uh, borders but you'll find two or three books there's a whole genre now anti muhammadan literature sallallahu alaihi wasallam just books dedicated to denigrating and insulting him and as soon as a muslim raises his voice they say ah oh, we have freedom of speech this is freedom of speech not one person that i know of and i researched the issue not one human being on earth came to the defense of david irving and said freedom of speech what you, why is everyone so uptight jail that's his opinion right not one person when it comes to us when people slander the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam suddenly oh relax muslim whoa wow you guys are angry freedom of speech we're not looking for laws to be passed right we're looking for cultural sensitivity there are certain things in in certain cultures that are just taboo to talk about it's taboo you go to 1950s and you listen to politicians they're dropping the n word left and right dropping it left and right and it's all good back then nobody cares that's how it was but try to do that now that person's ostracized completely fired from his job disgraced right it's a cultural taboo you can't do that anymore there's a cultural sensitivity so that's what all we're asking we're not trying to get you know you read some of these profligates these muslims want to change the constitution and, and they want to change freedom of speech and they're trying to get these anti blasphemy laws passed not on my watch don't tread on me right no we're not we're asking for cultural sensitivity that's all we're saying the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is more beloved to us than anything in creation anything in creation sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam so we defend him not because he needs a defense he doesn't need anything from us but because people are being indoctrinated people that can potentially be guided i have these false notions of who he was sallallahu alaihi wasallam and in turn there's a backlash against muslims and our children and this is very very dangerous am i supposed to talk now oh <laughs> yes oh <laughs> Where's uh is I'm going to have it. What is this? What do you think? What do you want? No, no, no. So, no. Oh, sorry, Palas. So, I've I've spoken too much already. Um No, no, no. That's not what he said, but <laughs> But that's my opinion. That's my assessment. Um so forgive me for speaking out of turn. I know Feridun is here and Abdullah Ali is here, so um, we want to make some dhikr inshallah ta'ala. I Uh, I've requested that another speaker come and speak but I guess we're going to make some dhikr with Qari Umar inshallah ta'ala so sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin